Amen. We well, guys can go ahead and have a seat. I'm excited to, to be here with you guys. My name is Robert, a family pastor here, and uh, I'm excited to be sharing with you guys, excited for this message. I know we're supposed to be excited about all of them, but I'm, I'm especially excited about this one. And I'm, I'm excited because I think that this is going to hit home for a lot of you. And I think if you're in a place where you've ever had questions about prayer, you've ever wondered why you should pray, ever wondered what prayer will actually do for your life, you ever wondered, like, how do I know it's actually doing anything? How do I know that, that God's hearing my prayers, that something's going to happen on the other side of it? Then this message is for you. Because when you look at Christianity, prayer is kind of the central thing throughout all of what we do, right? We've prayed multiple times in this service. We, you haven't even been here half an hour yet, and we've had multiple prayers. We, we encourage you guys to be praying continually. You know, we, we, we pray in church services. We pray for our meals. We pray when we study the Bible. We pray the beginning and the end of the day. We pray at weddings. We pray at funerals. We pray at, at public gatherings and big events. First Thessalonians says that we should pray without ceasing, and that's God's will for our life. It's, it's over and over again, as you look at Christianity, prayer is right there at the middle of it. And yet many of you maybe are here and you're new to, to following God, and you're like, okay, but what's the point? Or maybe you're not new to following God. You've been doing this for a while, and it's still in the back of your head, and you maybe don't feel like you can ask that question out loud, but you're wondering, what's the point? Or maybe you're in a place where you're like, hey, when other people pray, cool things happen, but when it seems like I pray, nothing happens. What gives with that? And so we're going to look at a story from the book of Acts. We're going to be in chapter 12. If you want to open up there. Um, and this event shows us a lot about prayer, shows us a lot about how we navigate this topic and how we navigate really difficulties as well. Because, you know, it seems that when difficulties come, that's when we go to God in prayer. And it's no different for the people here in Acts because chapter 11 is full of some great things. They're, they're following God. Cool things are happening. The, the gospel is reaching the Gentiles, these new people groups. The church is expanding. The church is doing cool new things. And then chapter 12 hits and some not so cool things happen. So let's take a look at that. Acts chapter 12, we're going to start in verse 1 together. And I'm in Romans, the wrong book, so that's helpful. Way to plan ahead, Robert. So Acts chapter 12, starting in verse 1, it says this. It says, About that time Herod the king laid violent hands on some of those who belonged to the church. He killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. This was during the days of unleavened bread. So we're going to pause here. We're going to kind of just tiptoe through this passage and see what's going on. So we're Again, like I said, chapter 12 is a little bit of a turn here. There's some not so great things happening. So King Herod, this is actually the third Herod that we see in the New Testament. This is Herod Agrippa I. And, and Herod here decides that a cool thing to do is to, to persecute some Christians. Now, there's a backstory behind that. Herod actually has a pretty big kingdom, but he got it as kind of a last favor from the people in Rome. He had gotten in some trouble, made some people mad. Like, hey, why don't you go down here, make this your kingdom, see if you can make something of your life, is essentially what happened with him. And so Herod is looking for some fans. And he sees this culture war between the Jews and the Christians, and he goes, I see an opportunity to make some fans. So he begins persecuting Christians, finds, hey, they're happy with that. He kills James and finds out that some of these extreme kind of radical Jews get really excited about that. And he goes, cool, let's grab Peter also. Now, this is a big deal because James is one of the disciples. He's the first disciple to be martyred. And, and not only that, James is, is, is part of the uh, kind of inner circle of Jesus' disciples. You had Peter, James, and John that were out of the 12, kind of the, the favorites, if you will, of Jesus, that inner circle. So this was terrible news to the church. This is a huge blow to the church. And they had Peter, the most kind of vocal, present, visible leader. And so what's the church do? Verse 5, it says, So Peter was kept in prison, but earnest prayer for him was made to God by the church. So the, the church sees what's happening, and they go, man, we have to pray. Earnest prayer. They're not just saying, oh, hey, you know, here's my prayer request for the week. They're, this is an earnest. You could even say desperate prayer is made by the church for Peter. 
So let's keep going. Let's see what happens next. Verse six, it says, now when Herod was about to bring him out on that very night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains and sentries before the door were guarding the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood next to him and a light shone in the cell. He struck Peter on the side and woke him up saying, get up quickly. And the chains fell off his hands and the angel said to him, dress yourself and put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. This is, this is where the story gets really, really cool, really, really awesome as well. But, but notice, so the night before Peter is going to be executed, like it's pretty clear that's what's happening. Where is Peter? He's asleep, like very soundly asleep in his jail cell. It says bound to two soldiers. Here he is like chains, like two guys, probably a little stinky, not the best looking guys in the world. They're sleeping. Now, I don't know about you, but... If I've got a big day coming up, we're going on a trip, I've got a big thing going on the next day, there's something coming the next day, I don't sleep well. How many of you are, are, are with me with that? Like you, your brain like won't shut off. You're like, did I pack this? Did I check the air in the tires? Did I do that? Like I'm, I'm thinking about all these things and my brain just won't shut off. But there's Peter, sound asleep. So asleep, he has to get hit to be woken up. He's like a teenager, like after, you know, a Friday night, is just like totally passed out. And it, it makes you kind of ask why. And, and we'll loop back around to this, but I think Peter was, was so soundly asleep because he so trusted in what God was going to do. No matter his circumstances, no matter what was going on, Peter trusted with what God was going to do as a result of his circumstance. But the angel comes, you know, the, the great jailbreak from heaven, like the angel comes, wakes up Peter, and, and Peter still isn't like really with it. He, you know, he has to hit Peter to wake him up, and then it's like getting a kindergarten out of the, the house to go to school. He's like, okay, now put your shoes on, now put your jacket on, and Peter's just like, you kind of, if you've ever had kids that go to school, like you feel what that angel's feeling in the moment. You're just like, come on. And it makes you wonder, like, why isn't Peter just, like, rushing? Why isn't he like, yes, let's go. This is, this is my chance for freedom. This is where I get out. Verse 9 kind of tells us why. It says, he went out and followed him, and he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real, but he thought he was seeing a vision. Peter was in jail, about to be executed the next morning. His friend James had already seen that same fate. Peter probably fell asleep that night praying to God for deliverance, but praying that God's will would be done probably as well, but praying that God would rescue, that God would save him. And there he is in the middle of being saved, didn't believe that it was happening. Church, how prone are we to seeing God literally answering our prayers in front of us and going, nah, it's not real. Eh, it's, it, I'm just I'm imagining things. It's just chance. It's just coincidence. He didn't believe it was real. Verse 10, but when they passed through the first gate and the second guard, they came to the iron gate leading into the city and it opened for them of its own accord. They didn't even have a clicker, just opened. <laughs> and they went out and went along one street and immediately the angel left him. When Peter came to himself, he said, now I am sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod and from all the Jewish people were expecting. I don't know what the now moment was. I don't know if it was like the gate opening, the angel disappearing. In fact, he's in the street. I don't know, but he believed it. Verse 12, when he realized this, he went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, whose other name was Mark, where many were gathered together and were praying. When he knocked at the door of the gateway, a servant girl named Rhoda came to answer. Recognizing Peter's voice in her joy, she didn't open the gate, but ran in and reported that Peter was standing at the gate. I want to meet Rhoda. <laughs> like, she's so sweet. She's so excited. Like, Peter's free. We've been praying for him. He's free. Leaves him right there at the gate, like just begging to be rearrested and taken back into jail. It's so great. Verse 15. But they said to her, you are out of your mind. But she kept insisting that it was so and they kept saying, well, it's his angel then. Okay, these people are gathered at Mary's house, right? What are they, what are they gathered there to do? To pray. Like, we can interact here a little bit. It's okay. They're there to pray. Who are they praying for? Peter in his release, right? 
that they were literally having a special called prayer meeting for Peter's safety and deliverance from Herod, this crazy power-hungry guy that's going to kill him. They get news, albeit from a little bit of an airhead, they get news that he's literally outside knocking at the door. Eh, it's not real. Didn't happen. And if it did happen, he's already dead, and that's his ghost, essentially, is what they're saying. Again, how prone are we to, to literally seeing God at work and dismissing it because of our own doubts, our own hesitations, our own questions? They're literally praying for something. It's being visibly manifest before their eyes and like, no, it's not real. But Peter continued knocking. When they opened, they saw him and were amazed, but motioning to them with his hand to be silent, he described how the Lord had brought him out of prison. He said, tell these things to James and to the brothers. And he departed and went to another place. Now when day came, there was no little disturbance amongst the soldiers over what had become of Peter. And after Herod searched for him and didn't find him, he examined the sentries and ordered that they should be put to death. And he went down from Judea to Caesarea and spent time there. What a crazy event. What a crazy story. And, and there's a lot of little tangents that we could explore in the midst of this. There's a lot of things we could unpack. But what I want to focus on is the fact that, that the church was in a very dire situation, a very perilous situation for Peter. And they said, hey, we need to pray. And their prayers were literally answered right in front of their eyes. And so what I want to do tonight is talk about how, what can we learn from this in order to pray prayers that make an impact? Like, how can we kind of follow after their steps and, and be in a place of our faith, of our walk with God, where when we pray, we're making an impact on the world around us? And, and I think we got three big things we can learn from this, three lessons that this story teaches. If we want to do this, we need to first acknowledge that we need God's help and ask for it. See, the, the, the early church, they acknowledged that their only thing that they could do was to petition God for help. They couldn't go knock on Herod's door and say, hey, that, that dude Peter you've got, can we, can we like grab him, go get some Dairy Queen and like hang out and then just kind of disappear? Like they knew they couldn't go. There's 16 soldiers guarding Peter in his jail cell. They couldn't get him out. They acknowledged that they needed God's help and they went and asked for help. And see, when we look at this, we, we see that, that we can get to that point, but how often do we get to that point of asking for God's help when it's our last option, our last resort, our final hope is in prayer? What if it wasn't that? What if we acknowledged that we needed God's help before it was in that point of desperation? What if we prayed for our marriage before we were separated and had divorce, files, or divorce papers filed? What if we, we prayed for our finances before we were Googling bankruptcy lawyers? What if we were praying for our health and our fitness before we exhausted every option of treatment that we had from doctors? See, I think that, that we all have some barriers when it comes to us walking with faith and, and living with that acknowledgement of our need for prayer that keeps us from doing it until we're at that point of desperation. I think we got three big barriers. The first is pride. We all have pride that, that keeps us from saying, hey, God, I need help. We, we want to be in a place where we have it figured out, where we've got it under control, where we've got it handled, and we go, hey, God, let me handle it, and if I can't get it, then you can step in. But 2 Chronicles verse seven, chapter 7, verse 14 says this. It says, if my people who are called by my name, listen to this, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, and I will hear from heaven and forgive their sins and heal their land. What do we need to do first? It says we need to humble ourselves. We need to say, I don't have it figured out. I do need help. God, you are the place that I get my help. Our first barrier of really connecting in prayer is our pride. And I think for many of us, the thing that's keeping us from seeing God at work in our life is our own pride and stubbornness. Second barrier I think we have is fear. Maybe it's fear of just admitting that there's something going on in our life. Maybe it's fear of other people finding out and we want to keep it to ourselves. Maybe even more significantly, it's fear that we're going to pray and it's not going to work. Maybe you've had a James moment. 
You've seen this moment like the early church, James in prison, you know, a, a dangerous situation, and you've prayed and nothing's happened. Or you've prayed and the exact thing you didn't want to happen is what the result was. And maybe you're like, I've, I've done that prayer thing once, didn't work, I'm good. Maybe it's the fear that it won't work, or conversely, maybe you're afraid you are gonna pray and it is gonna work, and it's gonna force you to confront your own doubts and hesitations about who God is. Maybe fear is that thing that's holding you back. Finally, maybe that, that thing that's, that's keeping you from acknowledging your need for prayer and going to God is sin. Maybe it's sin in your life. Maybe you're in a place where you're like, hey, I know my life's a mess. I got sin. I don't need to talk to God until I get this stuff cleaned up. Like we're teenagers again and we're like, hey, I need a favor from mom and dad, but I got to do my chores and clean my room before I go ask. Like maybe that's it. Or maybe you're just in a place where you're far from God because of the sin you're living in that you're like, I don't even know where to start. Scripture says that our sin creates a separation between us and God. Or maybe you don't wanna pray for the situation you're in because you know it's sin that got you into that mess. You don't wanna pray for the marriage that is barely hanging on because you know it was a whole bunch of sin that led into that mess. You don't wanna pray for your finances because you're like, hey, I don't really want God looking over my books and the decisions I've been making. You don't wanna pray for that situation that's a mess because you know it was your own sin and rebellion that blew everything up in your face. Listen again to 2 Chronicles 7. It says, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and heal their land. God wants to hear from us. God wants to forgive us of our sins. God wants us to reconcile our relationship with him. So if, if the sin is that barrier that's holding you back, repent and draw close to him. But if we wanna pray prayers that make an impact, that, that, that really influence our world and the life that we live following after God, we have to acknowledge that we need God's help and ask for it. Secondly, we need to invite other people to pray. You need to invite others to pray with you. See, going back to the story, I love how, how Peter finds them. He gets out of jail, kind of wanders through the street in the middle of the night, goes to Mary and John Mark's house, and he finds people gathered there praying. There, there's a, a special called prayer meeting, and there's this beautiful like unity and, and commonality of purpose in this. And, and it's so wonderful because the church realized that they needed to gather together with that common goal, that common purpose of prayer for that singular thing. But I think in today's society, we've, we've added this, this element of Christianity that I don't know is really that healthy. We somewhere along the way, picked up this idea that the goal of Christianity is for us to have everything figured out. The, the goal of, of us being you know, a Christian is to, to be like a perfect juggler for all the different things of life going on. And that when we get to a point of like perfection as a Christian, it's that we can like handle everything. But that's not at all what the gospel is. See, the point of Christianity isn't to have everything figured out it's to admit that you can't have everything figured out. The, the goal of Christianity isn't to say, hey, I'm perfect and can, can juggle all this stuff, I don't need help, but the opposite to say, I can't do this, I need help from Jesus. And it's us going to God and saying, hey, I need your help every single day in every situation. And when we're doing that well, we look around at other believers and we realize we're not perfect people but we're all just beggars pointing out where the bread is, and that is Jesus. And along the way, we realize, hey, other people might need some help as well. And, and as I was thinking about this, I thought of a story from the Old Testament, book of Exodus, chapter 17. There's this moment that happens in Israel is being attacked by an enemy, and it's not going well. And so Moses, their leader at the time, he goes up on a mountain to kind of oversee the battle to get a better vantage point and to go to God and ask for help. And, and in scripture, it says that he went up on the mountain, he had a staff that he got, you know, that special stick that we we're like, I want one of those. He takes it up there and he's overseeing the battle and he holds up his arm in his hands and he's petitioning God for help. And as he holds up his arms, he can see Israel gaining control of the battle. And he continues to hold it up and says that, that he, he got tired and took a little break and, and the enemy began to overtake them. 
Now, I don't know about you, if you've ever like, had to hold something above your head for any length of time. I had to replace a light fixture a couple days ago in a laundry room. And I'm, I'm on a ladder, I'm holding up the new light fixture, and I'm like trying to find a stud and trying to hold the screw and trying to grab my drill and trying to put it in. And after about like 2.8 seconds, my arms are like on fire and like shaking, and I'm like, I'm gonna drop everything. And there's, there's Moses up on the mountain saying, I'm gonna hold this up. And the only way for us to win is to hold up my arms. But battles don't last just 2.8 seconds. They go on a while. And so Moses got tired, but he knew he couldn't let his arms down. But thankfully, he wasn't there alone. His brother Aaron and their friend Hur were up on the mountain with them, and they said, hey, Moses, you need to sit down right there, and you need to let us hold up your arms for you. And scripture says that until nightfall, they held up his arms, and uh, uh, by, by the end of the day, Israel had won the battle. Now, when you look at that, you realize the importance of people being there to support and help you. And so many of us are trying to hold things up. We're trying to hold up our life, our situation, the things going on, but we're trying to do it alone. And it's not working well. And so I wanna challenge you today that whatever you've got going on, invite some people to help lift you up. Maybe it's some, some tangible, like actual things they can be doing in your life to help you. Or maybe it's just you need someone to lift you up in prayer. You need some people to come alongside you and pray with you for that situation you're struggling through. So I'm gonna challenge you to do that right now. I wanna challenge you, if you have something going on that you need prayer for, I want you to send a text message, put a post on social media and say, hey, here's what's going on, would you pray for me? If that's a little too, too much for you, at the end of our service, we're gonna have people down here across the front of their stage on our prayer team come talk to one of them, say, hey, here's what's going on, would you pray for me? If that's still a little bit too much for you, in the back of your seat, there's a, a card that says prayer on it, it's got blue on it. Grab one of those, fill out what, what's going on. If you're watching online, click the contact page on our website and just put in what's going on so our staff can be praying for you this week. Invite some people to join with you in prayer so that, that you can, can find victory, so that you can find help, so you can find support in what you're going through. Finally, as we look at, at this situation, I think there's one last, even bigger thing that we have to recognize if we wanna pray prayers that make an impact, and that is that we have to trust God with the outcome. And if I'm honest, this is the most difficult point of this whole thing, because we can do the first ones, and we kind of work through those barriers and do all that stuff, and then we get here, and this is where the rubber meets the road a little bit. Because if we're honest, like we've all prayed prayers that didn't get answered the way we wanted. And, and we can't stand up here, I can't stand up here and say, hey, here's exactly why God did or didn't answer this prayer. I can't say exactly why God prevents some bad things from happening but not others. I can't say exactly why God grants some requests but not others. But, but I do know that when we trust God with whatever the outcome is, that's when we can truly follow after him and, and walk in faith because that's what the, the church here did. That's what, what Peter was doing in the midst of that. They had seen James, you know, get arrested and persecuted and killed and here they are with Peter and their only choice was to just trust God with whatever the outcome was. And thankfully, God worked. Peter was miraculously, you know, freed and, and set out of that prison, but that doesn't always happen. See, the Bible's full of just amazing, like, answered prayers and miraculous things that happen in response to the prayers of his people, but it's also full of great godly people who prayed and didn't get their prayers answered. You look at the Old Testament character of Job, this great godly man who was righteous, it says, and, and a man that was following after God, and in a matter of hours, his life was just made miserable, every good thing taken from him. And he prayed and asked God to fix and restore, and for a long time, nothing happened. You look at, at the Apostle Paul, the, the guy that we're going to look at kind of with the remainder of the book of Acts. And in 2 Corinthians, he says there's this thing he called the thorn in his flesh, this thing that caused him anguish and suffering. And it says that he prayed and petitioned and begged God to take it away, and he didn't. It says instead he just had to learn to trust and rely on God more. You look at King David, the son that he had with Bathsheba was sick and dying, and he petitions and begs God to spare this child's life, but the child still died. 
You look at Hebrews 11 and all these great heroes, it's kind of like hall of fame of our characters of faith. And it's full of guys that defeated enemies and conquered nations and closed the mouths of lions. And then it's full of great godly men who prayed and were, were really after God's heart, but were in places where they were killed, they were mocked, they were scourged, they were tortured, they were beaten. See, when it comes to prayer, we can, we can lay everything out, but it, at the end of the day, we have to trust that God is still good no matter what the outcome is. Because, like I said, I can't answer why every situation ends the way it does, but what I do know is that God always hears our prayers, and God always answers our prayers. You can answer them in one of three ways, with a yes, which is what we all want, with a, a not right now, which isn't great, but usually we can look back with hindsight and go, hey God, thanks for not answering my prayer right then. Thanks for waiting. But the, the most unpleasant way is with that no. And sometimes it's because we pray for stupid things. It's like we're 16 year olds asking for a Lamborghini for our first car and God's up in heaven going, no, like no. But sometimes we're asking for great things. We're asking for the James to be set free and saved. We're asking for kids to, to overcome illness and disease. We're asking for people's lives to be spared, for situations to work out wonderfully. And those aren't answered the way we want. And the truth is that God never promises us that he's going to spare us from every pain and difficulty and struggle in this life. Instead, he promises that he's never going to leave us or forsake us. He promises that he's never going to, to not be with us through the struggle that we have. He also promises that he's going to redeem every suffering, every hardship. It says that in eternity, when we're with him in heaven, there he will wipe away every suffering, every disease, every pain, every tragedy, every tear. So it comes back to us. Are we willing to trust God with the outcome? The reason I think Peter slept so well that night is because he fell asleep praying to God, asking, would you please set me free from this prison? But no matter what happens, I trust you. I trust you with whatever the outcome of this situation is. And see, I, I, I preach this tonight as someone who's needing to preach this to myself as well because about five or six weeks ago, I was given this assignment. It seems that in the last several weeks, there's been several things that have come up that, you know, either people have asked me to be praying for or personal situations that have really gotten me to the point of, like, am I going to trust the outcome even if it's not what I want? Situations where every time you get an update, it's a little further away from what you were hoping for, but you're like, hey, am I still going to trust God and trust the outcome Trust that he's still going to work through this. Because see, when we can, can pray, not just saying, hey God, I'm going to praise and exalt you for the result I want, but I'm gonna pray and petition what I want to see happen, but praise you no matter what the outcome is. We get one step closer to really connecting with God and praying prayers that make an impact. See, today I hope that, that you don't just see prayer as something you do before meals or that we use as a punctuation mark for our church services, but that you see it as a way to communicate with your Savior to say, hey, Heavenly Father, here's what's going on in my life, and that you can truly see it as a way to make an impact on your life and the lives of people around you as you say, hey, God, I'm gonna trust you with whatever the outcome of this is because when we do that, we'll see God work sometimes before our very own eyes. Let's join together right now and pray. God, we confess that we don't always have the faith, the trust to, to walk with you through the difficulties. We see moments unfolding, moments that are, are hard and tragic, and God, instead of us drawing closer to you, often we, we doubt your existence, we doubt your presence, so God, help us to not do that. Help us like the early church here to see difficulties and tragedies and draw closer to you and draw deeper on our faith and reliance on you. God, help us to not live in, in fear or in pride or sin, but, but really to trust in you and to live a life full of prayer, full of conversation with you. 
God, we want to be people who pray and it makes an impact in our life. So help us to do that. Help us to, to really trust you and, and pray in a way that, that we are asking for your will to be done, for you to be at work in our life. And God, help us to, to see you at work, to not be blind to you answering our prayers like Peter and the church here, but also help us to not be angry if our prayers aren't answered the way we want them to be. Because God, we know that, that your ways are higher than our ways. Your thoughts are greater than our thoughts. So help us to trust in you each and every day. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.